see the recording has started. So I just wanted to welcome everyone to the global webinar. Um, I'm Sean Lovell. I normally co-chair the Brown Bag Seminars with uh, Alex. Alex is out today, uh, and I wanted to introduce a special presenter today, uh, Mr. Andrew Trask, who is the leader of the Open Mind community, and uh, he's going to give a tutorial on remote data science to us. So uh, remote data science touches on a topic that I think is at the heart of official statistics, which is specifically how we access private information for the public good. So accessing private information is kind of at the core of what official statistics is about, right? Data collection exercises like the census, time use surveys, they all contain incredibly private information. And without this information, we couldn't produce indicators on population, inflation, home prices, and so forth. So it really is central to what we do. And the model that we've, we've used, you know, for since since the beginning really has been to work on the, to have a strong culture of trust and data confidentiality. Trust in official statistics is so central to our mission that it's been enshrined in several of the principles of official st statistics. And uh, importantly, this data, when it's collected, it's held centrally by the statistical agency and it's considered protected access is limited you can't be used for uh, enforcement purposes and that sort of thing so this all this to give a, a a context to how i see the the research done by the open mind community um, today's presentation is going to discuss techniques that allow us to answer questions from data we can't see and this for me sounds like magic and I, I always think of the quote by Arthur Clarke, who said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So my hope is that by the end of this talk, remote data science will appear less like magic to me and more like something that I could imagine drawing on as I do uh, data processing workflows or as other people design statistical capacity building projects and so on. So I, I hope that uh, gives a uh, meaningful context to where, how I how I see this and why I sort of reached out to Andrew to give this presentation. So now to introduce Andrew. Andrew is a PhD student at the University of Oxford studying privacy preserving techniques, and he's the leader of the OpenMind.org community, a group of over 12,000 members producing free open source code, education, uh, and impact projects in the area of privacy preserving techniques. He is also a member of the United Nations Privacy Task Team, uh, an affiliate at the Center for the Governance of AI at Oxford, and he wrote a book entitled Grokking Deep Learning, which has sold over 19,000 copies worldwide. So uh, before we begin, uh, just let me quickly mention a couple of things. We will have a question and answer session at the end. You can raise your hand and take the floor, or you, um, if you would prefer, you can also just write in the chat and we'll publicly uh, read it for you. Uh, as always, this global webinar is being recorded. I ask that you keep your microphones muted. And now I would like to turn over the session to Ronald, who will also give an introduction and uh, discuss and then introduce Andrew. Yes, uh, th thank you, Sean. Yeah, I, I'm very happy to um, uh, to introduce this uh, uh, this presentation, this session uh, with uh, with Andrew Trask. Uh, so um, the context here, that's that's why I come in, is um, the uh, we have a, a United Nations Committee of Experts on Big Data and Data Science for Official Statistics. Um, it was previously known as the Global Working Group on Big Data. It's been established and uh, was it was established in 2014. Um, by the uh, by the community of official statistics so under the uh, un statistical commission it's a, it's an intergovernmental body uh, officially uh, 31 countries and 16 organizations in there uh, but really we are working uh, with a much larger uh, stakeholder community um, with uh, private sector uh, academia research institutes uh, uh, and national uh, sorry uh, non-government organizations um, and work on on a number of a variety of, uh, of of big data sources, doing training, and also looking at uh, at some of the cross cutting issues. And one of them, very important one, is uh, is the privacy preserving techniques. Uh, early on, uh, uh, in uh, like say 2014, 15, 16, we we're we we're looking very closely on access to data because that's that's one of the uh, let's say. Um, 
main challenges uh, in in the uh, in working with uh, with with big data, uh, especially like mobile phone data and so forth. Uh, there are sensitive data uh, as as a community of official statistics. We want to keep trust uh, with the public that that uh, data are uh, treated uh, carefully uh, with, with with preservation of privacy. Uh, and and so access has been a challenge. And so we we're happy. We started with the uh, privacy preserving techniques around uh, two thousand seventeen eighteen to see if that can actually help us in getting more access to these kind of um, uh, sensitive data. Uh, so. So it's it's an important topic for us, and we're also very happy that uh, academics and research institutes from the private sector have been willing to work with us because it's a it's a very technical issue. Um, the uh, sometimes the technology uh, uh, makes it less um, how you say that uh, accessible uh, in terms of of knowledge sharing uh, for the larger public. Uh, so we need these experts and we also need, in, in my view, to mainstream the methods uh, which are presented here and especially mainstream it throughout the uh, uh, community official statistics, throughout national statistical levels and others, because that will actually in the end help us uh, to have more access to these kinds of data where we can uh, uh, very much maintain trust uh, and 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 use the data at the same time. So I'll, I'll stop here. I've been working with Andrew for uh, the last couple of years, and especially the last couple of months uh, on on getting um, those techniques uh, used by uh, uh, the national statistical offices. And I hope that we'll will continue and and will will um, bear fruit uh, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, certainly, next couple of years that we will do this. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for coming and um, um, really appreciate uh, your time and attention today. I hope that you find this to be a, a, a really interesting topic. So um, let's see. So I'm going to share my screen um, and we'll make sure everything is set up um, correctly. Um, let's see here. Um, screen one. Um, can you see my screen OK? Is that uh, is that full screen yeah. view working for anybody? Looks yeah. great. Excellent. So um, today, um, as as uh, both the generous introductions um, uh, introduced, today we're going to be talking about sort of remote data science. We're going to be asking one very specific question, which is: Is it possible to answer questions using data that we we cannot see? And and the whole premise for this question is that if it is possible for us to answer questions using data we cannot see, then then we have the ability to answer questions using data at organizations and institutions and countries that 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 aren't our own, right? Which means that that we can go from sort of the information that's just at our at our own institution um, um, to to information at many different institutions, which is presumably you know sort of orders of magnitude. Um, uh, increase in the, sort of the, the, the amount of information that we can use to answer questions and thus sort of increasing sort of the accuracy and, and the range of questions that, that, that we can indeed answer. So in asking this question, I want to start with, um, you know, a, a, a uh, particularly difficult uh, question to answer, you know, like uh, what, what do tumors look like in humans? And if you wanted to answer this type of question using data, right, you, you would first start by like downloading millions of of, of tumor images, um, then, but you wouldn't be able to do that directly. You'd have to buy that from some sort of provider, like like a hospital. And if you were going to buy it, you'd have to convince someone that you're going to be able to to pay them back, or, or someone to someone to finance your project and, and and a business plan, or how you're going to sort of sort of pay them back, or in, or in the case of you know uh, uh, a department, like getting sort of department budget to to access this 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 kind of really sensitive data, and go through lots of other different steps to like try to figure out how to acquire the ultimate data set to 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 be able to to work on this problem. But if we wanted to answer a different question, like what do you know handwritten digits look like, or or um, you know some some other question that's sort of based on pub, you know data that we can just download from the internet, well this ends up being being much easier. Right? We just we just go online, download the data, download some you know statistical statistical scripts or, or, or programs and and run it, and we can get you know sort of sort of state of the art access uh, to or state state of the art uh, ability to to bring this kind of information. Um, and the difference between these two scenarios is that sort of getting access to, to to private data and private information is extremely extremely difficult. And so this this really changes and limits the 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 ability for us to answer some questions, uh, which might require sort of data that is either very sensitive or very 
very um, valuable that people are, are hesitant to share relative to sort of other questions we can answer really, really easily using powerful statistical tools um, because the data is, is sort of readily available or the data is within our own, our own institution. And so this, this um, uh, means that we spend a lot of times working on, on data sets which are, which are more public, especially people who are outside of, of, of major statistical centers, as opposed to questions that are sort of very person centric and, and very sort of sort of sort of centered around uh, you know, people in their daily lives, which was where I think sort of some of the most important problems are. And so this brings us back to kind of this core thesis, which is, you know, is it possible to answer questions using data that that we cannot see? And and you know, if, if the answer to this question is yes, I think the, the, the hope is that someday soon you'll be able to access sort of all the world's sort of statistical information or scientific information just as easily as you as you current, you know, install access to you know, statistical toolkits that you, you might be familiar with. Um, and and that, that, that you actually be able to access sort of a robust global network where you can where you can answer questions using data that's distributed across you know, thousands of different you know, you know, Bureau of Statistics or, or, or private companies or, or other government databases or, or academic centers without necessarily having to form a bespoke you know, custom relationship, custom partnership with every single institution you want to collaborate with on data because the infrastructure simply de-risks it, um, if, if this makes sense. So today, um, as mentioned, I'm, I, I am part of a community called OpenMind. OpenMind is a group of, uh, you know, a little over 11,000 people um, who are focused on lowering the barrier to entry to privacy and to technologies. We've been around for, um, I guess, almost almost four years now. Um, and and specifically today, we're going to be talking about a tool called PySift. This is sort of an instance of a, of a broader class of tools that we've been working on. So today, today we'll be showing um, most of these examples in, in, in Python. Um, but what we're going to walk through are sort of actually a set of, of generic tools um, for being able to leverage statistical tools that you're familiar with Sort of remotely and in, in a privacy preserving way so so think you know the, the statistical tools that, that you would work with every day um but but you'd be able to actually work with them on someone else's machine that you don't have access to on someone else's data that you don't have access to and there's an ensemble of of techniques and technologies that can make this sort of feel like the data is on your own machine even though it's somewhere else and give you sort of the the utility and the, the ability to sort of flexibly answer important questions while that data remains on on a remote machine somewhere else so um, the first tool we're going to talk about um, in this sort of series of tools is just basic remote execution. And, and I think what you're going to find is that throughout this um, talk, we're going to sort of start with things that are sort of simple um, and, and, and do most of the heavy lifting and then work towards sort of the more advanced tools that, that sort of plug really important sort of edge cases that, that some of these simpler tools don't, don't cover. So it's sort of increasing complexity as we go. So we'll, we'll start with basic remote execution. Um, so um, for those of you who are familiar with, with you know, statistical packages, um, you know, so most statistical packages have a core primitive, which is some type of array, right? So a nested list of numbers. So whether it's you know, MATLAB or R or, or you know, PyTorch or Pandas or, or TensorFlow, that sort of we all have this sort of core data structure in common, um, which is sort of like this, this nested matrix or, or tensor object. Um, and and the first thing that we do in this SIFT package is we, in, we, we, we propose a second core primitive other than just the tensor. And that second core primitive is the worker. And a worker is basically, a, you can think of it as a variable in your statistical package that points towards a remote machine, meaning it points towards an actual CPU sitting somewhere else that is holding data so that you can then sort of work with it. In this case, you know, let's say we have a, a pointer to serve some hospital, right? And then this allows me to leverage my sort of existing statistical package remotely, right? So, so in this case, you know, I created sort of the PyTorch version of this, whereas, you know, one, three, four, five, and I send this into a hospital data center. And what gets returned to me is a code generated pointer to that remote information, right? Which, which means that I can do simple operations that feel like the data is local, but under the hood, it's actually executing on the remote machine and then returning to me sort of pointers to the results, which also have sort of the same kind of code generated API, right? And so you can sort of see here how for, for just, just before we even get started with sort of, you know, uh, some of the more advanced technologies, um, uh, sort of a simple code generated remote execution ability means that we can have sort of the, the, the robustness of the tools that we like on data and machines that we never had to ask someone for direct access to. We never had to access, you know, ask to, you know, go on site into their hardware, you know, SSH into their machines and, and like provision all sorts of things, right? We just, we have sort of this limited, you know, allow list based remote execution ability that sort of feels very comfortable. And now you might be asking, whoa, wait, 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 so how do I actually look at this 
data that I'm that I'm looking at. That seems like a really really big deal. Well, the method that you use to download a pointer to anything, right, is this was what we call a dot get method. Um, and, and this is obviously a really, really important method because this is when you're pulling information back to you. And we'll, and we'll talk a bit more in a moment about about how we can sort of make this make this secure. But before we before we go any further, let's just, let's sort of check in, right? So we have we have this first tool, which is remote execution. And the great part about remote execution is it means that data can remain on one or more remote machines. Like we could have pointers to to hospitals all around the world, or stat centers all around the world, or government, you know, different 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 bureaus or private businesses or, or whatever. And, and, and in theory, we can have the flexibility of, of our favorite statistical tools while this data remains distributed in their control, meaning we don't have to ask for a copy in order to be able to work with it, right? However, there's still this question, how do we do good data science, good, good statistics without actually seeing the data ourselves? Like there's a, you know, data science and statistics are like inherently iterative, you, you know, processy. Like it's it's like uh, oh, I I query the data some, I learn a little bit. Oh, that 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 causes me to query it in a different way, and then query it in a different way. Um, um, you know, what what is this? Um, how do we actually do this if we're not really looking at the the underlying data? And and uh, one thing that I want to mention before we jump into the more sophisticated tools is that when you work with data that's especially large, especially big data, you know, often we we are already in a place where where the data is already too large for anyone to sit down and just read through all of it themselves. Like, and, and, and like the utility of doing that would be relatively limited. And so um, it turns out there's actually a lot of the data science um, sort of workflow that has sort of already started to evolve into a place that could be remote execution based, simply because you know we, we have lots of tools for working with data sets that are just too large for us to actually manually inspect all of them ourselves. And so, so you'll see that, like the, the next tool is really about just leveraging uh, a couple of those. So like when you think about you know sort of all the the, the data on internet or large databases or whatever, like the, the first thing you'll start with is just search, and and we can search on public metadata about the private data. Right. So in this particular case, so let's say we have, you know, a a a you know a, a bunch of different uh, medical institutions, and we want to search for information related to diabetes. Maybe we want to we want to know like how many people um, in any given you know jurisdiction uh, had diabetes, or we want you know we want to do some sort of sort of sort of uh, complicated analysis trying to correlate you know people getting diabetes with you know distributions of food or you know whatever the experiment might be. Right. Our ability to search for private data, which is distributed across many institutions means that we search on the public information that's about it. So, so for example, like if we, we, we search for this, we get a few results back, we look at, at the, um, the, the list of pointers that, that we get back, we can sort of look at a description on this pointer. Now we see, oh, there's you know, 10 baseline variables, age, sex, body mass index. So it's like some sort of study that like correlated this kind of information. And if we want to see like a few rows of it so that we can do maybe some feature engineering or some, some of the, the basic statistics, just like you would if you're working with like a massive data set, like you wouldn't do feature engineering necessarily uh, uh, on the entire data, you know, physically looking at the entire data set yourself, you'd grab a few rows, get an idea for what it's like, and then and then you know start con constructing your kind of statistical model or statistical approach from there. And I think all of these sort of techniques are still very valid in this sort of remote execution environment. And and and, and you know, for those of you who might ask, like I think this sample data, it's, it's perfectly reasonable for this to have been hand curated or generated, you know, through some sort of synthetic data approach. Um, but I just want to give you the sense that like a lot of the tools for dealing with data at scale sort of cross over really nicely and give us, again, a familiar um, sort of interface to working with data, even though it's it's distributed and, and we have limited access to sort of read individual records. So previously, you know, we had we had remote procedure calls where data can remain on a remote machine. Now we have sort of search and sample data where we can do some basic feature engineering and, 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 and sort of looking for data that's, that's sort of relevant to our problem. But we still have some limitations, right? What about this dot get function? Right, if I've got pointers to remote data set, like the ones we just had that were the result of the search, what prevents me from just using this remote interface to sort of steal data, right? And just, just download it myself because I, I wanted to see it. And this is where we start to get into uh, to sort of these, these more, more advanced privacy enhanced technologies. So, so um, differential privacy is, is a really fantastic tool. Um, and the purpose of differential privacy is to ensure that statistical analysis doesn't compromise privacy. And what we really mean is that we have a database. So let's say we have a database of people in it, you know, like one person per row, just, just to make it easy. Um, and we have some function or some query over this database, right? And the before we get into kind of more the, the I guess maybe the, the mass of it, I, the, the intuitive sense of what differential privacy is all about is that, is that you know, the, the output of my, if, if I took this database on the left, so as you know, I've got Bob, Bill, Sue, John, if, if I took this database, and I and I and I queried it, 
and then I removed, say, John from this database, and the out, and then I queried it again, and the output of my query did not change, then that would mean that the output of my query was not affected by John's participation, right? In a sense of like the, the, the difference between the database with John in it and with John removed or replaced with, you know, someone else doesn't change my query. Then, then, then I can sort of assume that like the output of my query is not dependent on, on John's private information. There's no private information about John coming into, you know, you're sort of leaking out as a, as a part of this query. And this is sort of like the intuitive definition. The intuitive definition for sort of perfect privacy is that the output of your query is the same between this database and any identical database with one row removed or replaced. Meaning we we want we in a perfect world, we would be able to make that guarantee, not just for John, but for every person in the database. Now, it turns out there's not that many queries that, that are sort of um, robust to uh, individual rows being removed or replaced. Um, um, but this uh, this sort of intuitive notion is still really useful. And now I want to talk about differential privacy from a from a slightly different perspective. So, so um, I have a, a twin sister. She's um, a, a political scientist. Um, um, she studies um, um, a variety of different things. Uh, her thesis is on actually um, the the uh, child marriage, which is like this 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 topic is you know, very difficult to survey. It can be sort of considered um, taboo in, in a lot of areas. And 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 whenever you need to survey something where 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 the thing you're surveying about could be taboo or could be could be something that like the people you're interviewing might have some incentive to be deceitful or to to maybe skew their answers a little bit or or, or otherwise lie maybe you're doing a survey over people participating in some illegal behavior or something like this um there's this sort of interesting privacy technique called randomized response and so the way randomized response works let's say i was going to survey um all of you and and so so what i would do let's, i'm going to ask you a, a true false question you know did you commit this crime right and um, um, what, what I do is I, I hand you a coin and I ask each one of you to flip this coin twice somewhere that I can't see it. And then I say, if the first coin flip is a heads, I want you to answer honestly, you know, have you ever committed this, this crime, right? But if the first coin flip is a tails, I want you to answer yes or no according to the second coin flip. Right, so so roughly half the time, people will be answering honestly, and the other half of the time, people will be answering randomly according to a perfect 50-50 coin flip. Which means that if if the true distribution, if like if 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 truly 60% of people had committed this crime, then what that would mean is is that half of the people would would, would answer you know with a 60% probability of, of yes, and the other half would be a perfect 50-50 because they have a coin flip. Which means I'm averaging this this 60% distribution with a 50-50 coin flip, which means the result of my survey would be 55%. So I know that if I survey a bunch of people using this technique and the output of that statistic is, or of that, of that survey indicates, oh, 55% of people um, committed this crime, then I know that because that was averaged with a 50-50 coin flip, that the true distribution is 60%. But the really powerful thing here is that even though I know the mean of the distribution is somewhere around 60%, I don't know which person was lying and which person was telling the truth. Each person has plausible deniability. They might have said yes, that they committed this crime because they actually did, or they might have said yes, because they flipped a certain series of coin flips that led to them sort of saying yes. And the degree of, and, and if, you're, you know, if you're listening closely, you'll, you'll notice that the, the degree of bias in, in, in the first coin flip actually affects um, um, sort of the degree of plausible deniability, the amount of information that is, that is coming out to, to me. And so when we consider what we do when we have a function that is not perfectly privacy preserving, <coughs> um, what we do is we actually add a certain degree of noise to either the database or the function itself. So adding noise to the database is called um, uh, input privacy, or sorry, input differential privacy uh, or local differential privacy. Um, and, and adding noise to the, the, the function is called sort of sort of global differential privacy. Um, and, and that sort of gives all the participants in the survey some degree of plausible deniability, right? Because if I, if I query this database again with John missing, right? And the function changes, it could have been because John is missing, or it could have been because that little bit of noise sort of changed the result of the function because the function itself has a little bit of random perturbations in it. So I just want to give you that sort of intuitive sense of differential privacy and the degree to which we measure sort of the, 
the amount of privacy that is being leaked from a function is called epsilon. So like epsilon is this really special parameter that allows us to sort of um, have an, a, a fixed upper bound on, on the, the amount of statistical information, sort of unique statistical information that is leaving, uh, leaving a database. And in the context of, of data science, we can, we, this can allow us to have something that's called a privacy budget. And a privacy budget means, oh, if I'm querying this database, right, then, then you know, the database owner might say, oh, you're allowed to do as many queries as you'd like as long as you stay under an epsilon budget of 10. Right, meaning the sum total of all your queries can't leak more than 10 epsilon worth of private information. Right, so that's what a privacy budget is about. So now, what does this look like in the context of remote statistics? That sort of interface that we were sort of building a, a minute ago. So let's say I've got this pointer to a data set. This is like the diabetes data set we were working with a second ago. And I call .get and try to download it, try to steal this private information. Oh no, I got an error, right? You just requested a data point which is private or which depends on data which is private. You can only query private data if noise is added. So use dot get epsilon to add the appropriate amount of noise. And so what we see here is that this is instructing us to say, hey, you tried to download private information. You, you actually need, you know, this would expend some amount of, of privacy budget. How much privacy budget do you want to spend at, at, at this moment? If I spend a lot of privacy budget, it's only going to add a little bit of noise to this data set. And if I spend a little bit, a little bit of privacy, but it's going to add more noise, and, and, and so that I can sort of stay under budget, sort of, sort of overall, if that, if that makes sense. So, uh, you know, I, I spend 0 0.1 epsilon, and 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 I, I can receive back my my results. So, in aggregate, what I want you to see here is is we're starting to build up different layers of tools, which, when used together, sort of allow us to have. Um, this 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 sort of remote access interface. There's actually one more thing I want to highlight before we go. So so. The, the, this this tool right here is, I think, really, really, really important. And the reason this tool is really, really important is that when, when you think about all the red tape, all the difficulty, all the painful process that it takes to get access to, to sort of data at another institution. Um, so let, let's consider like, um, so in, in, the, in the worst case, um, uh, I, I know of academics who like applied to get access to, um, in this case, it was it was medical information in, in the UK, and they waited, they had to wait seven years before approval went through. Like literally, they finished their PhD, someone else started their PhD, they finished their PhD, and then the next person is the one that actually got to receive the data because the, the, the data was sort of so sensitive and so private and so large, it took that long uh, to happen. But, you know, under more normal circumstances, you know, like with the, with the UK Biobank, you have to submit for background checks, you send your passport, and like all sorts of all sorts of heavy things, and then they send you a physical hard drive of like of like you know pri private data, right? Which is which is sort of worst of both worlds in the sense that like it's it's a potentially you know risky situation sent sending around sort of private information to people, but on the flip side, um, um, you still had tons of red tape to to get access to it. And and the important part about this remote execution differential privacy sort of put together is is not to say that like ah differential privacy is some absolute guarantee on you know that everyone shares that like sort of explicitly prevents any any harm happening but instead this epsilon is a measure of a degree of risk right which is based on the relationship between you and a, and a data owner and and the the important thing here is that these two tools combined should be able to take us from a world wherein either you have to physically go on site into a data center and sort of work with this data yourself one institution at a time right to a world where you can remotely access it and, and you don't even need to wait for a person at the center to sort of review your results before they can come back out. Because that's that's like standard procedure now. Like if you, if you, if you want to work with private data at, at most institutions that, that have it, you know, it's not just approvals to go, to go in. It's also approvals to then bring your statistical results out. And that can take multiple different, multiple days of people reading through your Python code or, or R script or whatever and trying to decide, oh, should, should we let this, you know, is this, is this being constructed in a way that they could be good or bad or otherwise? And, and the powerful thing about automatic differential privacy tools like this, right, where, where we can do computation and, and it will automatically compute the differential privacy budget under the hood, is that it gives the data owner the ability to automate a lot of the sort of the lower cost and simpler queries so that it's less time intensive to do this whole exchange. We can talk more about that in sort of the Q&A section um, towards the end as well. But for now, we're going to keep going. Um, so we solved a lot of important problems here, but we haven't solved everything, right? First, the data is safe, but any statistical models <laughs> in this environment are still put at risk, right? So, so I'm not downloading the data to me as a statistician, but but you know if if I send in some you know parametric model you know that's like you know really valuable or it has private data from other people like I have to trust each individual institution that they're not going to take 
my, my, my interim statistical model and do something bad with it. And secondarily, and this is what I think uh, sort of many of you might relate with, is that what if we need to do a join or, or computation across data from multiple different institutions at the same time? Well, simple remote execution doesn't solve that problem, right? Because because you would have to put all the data on the same remote machine. Like you'd have to convince, you know, this Bureau of Statistics and that Bureau of Statistics or this hospital and that hospital or this business and that business to co-locate their data at one machine, right? And that can be just as rigorous and time intensive and like like just as much red tape to do that as, as there would be for you, know, you to download it yourself, if sometimes even more. So this last tool we're going to talk about is called secure multi-party computation. And it, it has comparables um, to, to other techniques you might have heard of, like secure enclaves or functional encryption or homomorphic encryption. These all actually provide sort of the same guarantee, which is called input privacy, which we'll get into later. But, but let's just focus on this tool for now. It's a really, really cool tool if you have not, not come across it yet. So, so the textbook definition of secure MPC is that multiple people can combine their private inputs to compute a function without revealing their inputs to each other. But in the context of statistics, in the context of you know, you know, data science and, and, and machine learning, we're going to instead say secure MPC is the ability for multiple people to share ownership of a number, right? Let me show you what I mean. So let's say I have a number five. And I split it the two shares, two and a three. So two plus three equals five. Normally you would you would randomly choose these shares and you'd add them up modulo a large prime. But but um um I've I've you know sort of faked that oh we randomly found a two and a three just so it's intuitive for for us to follow along in in in, in the notebook. But um so yeah I've, I've got this five. I split it into two and three. We're gonna look at an algorithm called additive secret sharing. Okay, I've got two friends, Marianne and Bobby. I give them the shares and then I disappear. Now between Marianne and Bobby, this number five is encrypted. Neither person knows what value is encrypted between them because they only can see their own share, right? And the other share could be anything. It could be negative 2,565,643 or positive 2 billion, you know, like it could, could, could be literally anything. And, and the sum of them, right, is whatever this encrypted value would be. However, Additionally, we also get shared governance, which means if, if a number is shared across these different individuals, no one can download it. No one can use it without all these individuals agreeing. Sort of shared governance is a really nice property. However, the most incredible property is that despite the fact that it's in this in encrypted and shared governance state, you can actually do computation with it. So let's say we wanted to multiply it times two. Marianne multiplies her share times two. Bobby multiplies his share times two. All of a sudden, now we've got an encrypted 10. And neither of them knows what number is inside of their, their computation, right? And, and, and the important thing here is to say, okay, what if, what if, you know, I was wanting to do a join on data that was owned by Marianne and Bobby. Well, if I just take my numbers and split them into shares and give those across Marianne and Bobby, and, and you know, Bobby takes his data and splits it into shares and sends one set of shares to Marianne, and Marianne takes her data and splits it into shares and sends one set of shares to Bobby, now we can compute a join without anyone seeing any anybody else's inputs, right? And we get shared governance and, and encrypted computation all along the way to make sure that sort of no one does anything kind of foolish. And the most exciting part is, you know, models and data sets. You know, so our statistical models, our statistical algorithms, and the, and the data sets that, we're, that we that we learn from are just large collections of numbers which we can individually encrypt, right? So that, that, that five and that 10 could have been someone's age or weight or, you know, or, or, or a count of some type, right? And and what's even, perhaps even more exciting is that this notion of like of like taking data from 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 two different parties and having them exchange their shares across each other, so you can do shared computation across both of them, can be wrapped up again in a tool that looks and feels like our normal statistical package. So let me show you again. It's like this this tensor type. So so we're, we're just rolling rolling forward with PyTorch today. But but if I take the tensor one to three point five and I call dot share across Bob and Alice and Tail, what I've done is I've taken this tensor and split it into shares and 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 put it across these three individuals. And then I have, again, a very familiar interface. So I just do basic addition, or, or, or if I wanted to sort of train uh, you know, machine learning models since, since, we're, since we're using PyTorch today, like that, that is the future of being able to work with data that is sort of encrypted across multiple people and have it, have it feel like that, that you're still working with data that's on your machine, but these people are able to participate in, in sort of the governance of, 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 those, of those assets. Uh, and I don't have to actually share their input data with anyone else throughout the process. So what are some tools we learned about today? So you know, we, we did remote execution, we did search and sample, we did differential privacy for, for formal rigorous privacy budgeting, and we looked at secure MPC so that the model can be encrypted during training and we could do complex sort of joints and, and, and functions across multiple data owners. And so this brings us back to our, our question, you know, is it possible to answer questions using data we cannot see? And, and I hope that you can sort of see that, that with this sort of 
ensemble of tools together, like an ecosystem is sort of coming together that, that is going to facilitate something that looks a lot like the internet and websites and stuff like that. But instead of people hosting their website, they're going to host their data in some sort of API that allows your statistical packages to work with it and data sets at other institutions, right? And, and that the implication means that you know, every data scientist in, in our community will have the ability to, to, uh, to work with data that is, you know, 10 to 100 times larger than what they currently have access to because they'll be able to, to answer questions using data at other institutions that are like them, right? And I think that that's the real promise of, uh, of these tools. And, and you know, with, with the right work, that, that, that accessing the world's statistical information could be as easy as installing your favorite statistical package. And then we could spend less time working on sort of only public data tasks or tasks that are owned institution and more time working on sort of some of the most important, most human centric um, um, sort of problems that are, that are sort of out there. If you'd like to learn more um, about um, uh, about these techniques and their sort of current state and how, how to use them. Um, you can you can find a, a, a set of, a series of free courses that we're currently working on in, in collaboration um, with it with the privacy preserving task team as well that, that were announced um, uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, all, we've had almost seven thousand folks register um, so far, um, and we're sort of releasing new content every week. Um, so yeah, please please do let me know um, if or please do um, go go to that website if you'd be interested in in checking that out. Um, so yeah, and with that, I guess I'm I'm looking at the time, so maybe maybe it's best to actually go straight to um, to questions. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you thank you so much for your for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrew. I have to say that was a whirlwind tour of some pretty fascinating uh, technology. <laughs> Just want to give a round of applause. Uh, thank you. I know we can't oh, do it in one minute. Um, so we do have a couple questions, and I just want to remind everyone: if you are not uh, asking a question, please make sure your microphone is muted. Um, I would. I think we're going to agonize UC to go through the chat and make sure that uh, people are muted if their microphones are on. So uh, we do have some questions. I wanted to read, perhaps from the top. We had. Uh, if there's anyone who would like to ask a question in person, if you've asked it in the chat and you prefer to read your question, that is what we would actually prefer as well. So please raise your hand. Um, I can call on you. I apologize for talking a little bit quickly. I also I, I get a little excited. Um, I'll work on that. <laughs> I, I mean, I was I it could be I think yeah, it could be a challenge for a lot of us. So. But I, I, I can relate to that. So I wanted to ask the first question from how ye. How you ask, will the researchers, users of data be required to submit their results for approval before publishing? So. Yeah, so that, that's a fantastic question. So so um, this all depends on the preferences of the data owner. So I think the the um, um, so, so I guess if I were to show um, one more uh, demonstration, which I, I um, um, just want, to, want to be sort of wary of time, I think by default, the answer to that is yes. Um, meaning if I'm doing remote execution um, and I call dot get on a variable to try to download it and it stops me, right? I think that there's 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 two options. One, we have at least in the APIs that we're building, you submit a, a request in the Python API. Like literally you say like you take your variable X and go X dot request and then you specify a reason and some context around it. And that goes into a queue and there's actually a web UI and like a, and like a Jupyter notebook interface through which um, someone like a, what we call a data compliance officer can review the request and answer sort of yes or no to whether they want to allow you to download the result. Optionally, um, a data owner can also specify a privacy budget by which, you know, if you're under that privacy budget, you can skip that sort of approval process because it's you know sufficiently you know not privacy invasive. So like you could imagine that like um, if I'm doing a big statistical analysis. Um, and, I'm, and I'm remotely accessing data at 10 different organizations um, um, for kind of your basic small, you know, aggregate statistics, all the little exploratory things you do while you're in the, in the kind of the statistics or, or data science process, that, that these would be relatively low leakage in the sense of like they just, you know, and then these could pass under the, the sort of limit for the privacy budget. But then when you ask for kind of your big, your big statistical histogram or your big final statistical model um, at the end, this might um, be required to go through approval. So it, again, it's it's really these tools are flexible. They they kind of um, the, the the barrier can be as high or as low as as the data owner um, feels is appropriate given um, the, their relationship with the data scientist, um, um, sort of professional. If, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. I mean that helps me understand as well. I mean I personally was wondering um, this idea of you know requesting requesting approval. Is there is there a sense that 
that certain kinds of questions a data owner would not want to be answered. So that there are cases where there's an unknown, there's a little bit of uncertainty about, you know, what sort of questions can be answered uh, to begin with, with my data set. And, you know, I can imagine some of them would be uh, related to inadvertently re revealing, uh, you know, things like tax evasion or criminal activity or some sort of, mm -hmm. you know, you wouldn't want law enforcement to, to you know, come to these uh, APIs and start querying for potential, uh, you know, issues. So, totally. so the question is, how do you how do you provide a contract with people who want to be the good guys and provide public data, and also say, look, this can't be used against you? Is there a what what's the conversation around that been like? Yeah. So I think um, from from my perspective, um, uh, there's the, the this is a, a sort of a work in progress conversation because you know we come from the background of being, you know, technologists, and now we're starting to walk into more product development in the sense of like understanding at the end of the day, what do real people want? And like, what are the nuanced sort of risks and opportunities that the different stakeholders sort of face? Um, so for this, for this, so so some of this is like conversation, it's still work in progress. And, and I would say like, please do, you know, speak up and, 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 and you know, join the community and participate in, in sort of the development of these tools so that they can meet your needs. Um, in, in particular, I think that um, to, to begin, um, these networks of data owners are likely to have two main types of parties. One is called a domain owner, which is like this, you could think of that like a web domain where like they, they this is the server you load and you put your data into and you attach it to a network. And then we have like a network owner and that network owner um, um, is responsible for sort of facilitating connections and search and discovery and, and, and sort of user accounts and things like that across the network and sort of facilitate network services. And either of these bottlenecks have the ability to optionally configure um, things like ethical review or whatever. So sort of before before granting access to specific data sets, for example. So you can imagine I apply for an account at at, at a, a certain data owner, you know, at, at a statistics bureau, and and you know I submit you know a description of the project that I want to work on and the data sets that I would like to have access to, and they say, oh well, fantastic, okay, we don't want to allow you to have access to this data, but you're welcome to work with this data set, and we're going to give you a you know an epsilon budget of of two per day for ten days. Um, um, let us know when your when your major statistical results are done, and then we'll review those. Like some sort of process is like this, and and you can also imagine that at the network level, you can actually have two layers of this in the sense of like you could have you can imagine a, a network owner over the data that's distributed at many businesses. So think, you know, I don't know, like a, a statistics bureau working with data at a large number of private companies, for example, where there could be ethical review that is similar to the ethical review that you have at a data consortium or, um, or a data, data coalition or data collective or, or sort of data trust where, you know, normally data would be actually pooled directly to this network node. Um, and then that network node would would adjudicate who's allowed to do what types of research with it and this kind of thing. Um, um, but but so even in the context of a network, even if you don't centralize all the data amongst a data registry, you can still appoint this sort of secondary external party for additional ethical review over the shared resource across the network. Um, so, and so and actually, I think you can sort of view remote execution as actually having more, con strictly speaking, more control over over the ethics of how data is used than than not having remote execution. Because when you give someone a copy of a data set, you don't really have control over what they're going to do with it, right? And in the sense of like, it's very 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 difficult to know what people are going to do with data if. if if, if they do obtain a copy. And so allowing sort of for remote execution and the only thing that leaves your system is answers to questions, not the underlying data, actually gives you a lot more power and a lot more control long term over what the ethics um, uh, and, and, and privacy implications and sort of other implications because you are maintaining control over the only copy of your information. And, and so you don't have to worry about did they delete it? Did they share it with other people? Like all, all, all these kinds of things sort of sort of go away or are sort of seriously minimized. So, so I think this is sort of the structure of how I think this approval and ethics review is likely to happen. Um, and strictly speaking, you have more options at your disposal through, for, for ethical review and ethical limitations um, through a remote execution interface than you would through send, you know, sort of getting people direct access to, to a data set, which is why I'm sort of optimistic about that. Excellent. That's really a great response. I just wanted to pass the floor to uh, Ronald. He has a question. He raised his hand, so we try to get priority to hand raises. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. Well, I, I, I see there are more questions in the, in the chat as well. Uh, but um, I just had a, one one question okay, yeah. um, from my side, uh, Andrew. So thanks thanks for the uh, presentation. As as, uh, as Sean was indicating correctly, it's a it's a whirlwind. It's a lot of information, uh, a, a difficult to uh, process very quickly. Uh, one question is uh, on the epsilon. Uh, mm -hmm. So you say you see that as a. Um, uh, something that you that you get, like the privacy you get, or 
Um, is there um, the accuracy of the analysis? Is it affected mm -hmm. by the epsilon that you use, right? Or and and why why would we not put a higher as the uh, higher epsilon for all people instead of a small and higher epsilon for at the difference? Well, why why would you choose one over the other? Uh, I assume that I would hope that the data analysis would not be affected. So to you, yeah, fantastic question. Um, um, and this is a, a, a particularly important topic in the statistical community right now. And I don't know if you guys are following. There's a, there's a current um, legal um, uh, discussion going on between um, sort of I think I think it's Alabama and the U.S. Census Bureau, as I recall. It's, um, you can you can read some about it online. It's, it's also exploring this question. So in the context of differential privacy, it's a trade-off between three things: the accuracy of your final statistical results, the size of your data set, meaning the number of people who are in it, and then the epsilon guarantee that you want to have. So if you have access to a, you know, a massive amount of information, then even, even relatively um, small epsilon, really strong privacy guarantees don't affect your, your, your statistical results very much. Where it becomes challenging is if you want to provide a strong guarantee, but for example, you're, perf you're performing a sum over 10 people. If you're performing a sum over 10 people, and you're trying to have this guarantee that like you aren't gonna be able to reverse engineer information about one specific person from this sum over 10 people, you gotta add a lot of noise to create that level of plausible deniability, right? And, and that's that's not a reflection of differential privacy as a tool, that's a reflection of like hard statistical sort of sort of like even if you want to anonymize the data or do all sorts of those things like this, like that's like a sort of a, a fact of, of, of the data as it were. Um, and so um, there is this sort of long discussion of what do you do when you, when you don't have very much data and you, and you want to have a privacy guarantee. So first, um, networks of data, again, increase the, the, the size of the data that you have significantly, meaning, meaning if you're using differential privacy by itself, just on data that is only within your own institution, um, it's sort of more likely for, for, for differential privacy limits to become a problem with, with accuracy because it's, it's more likely that you have small amounts of data on specific areas, you know, in a specific geographic region or, or, or whatever. Um, but, but one of the reasons why these tools work well together is that sort of remote execution should offer, you know, for, for, for most use cases, um, a significant increase in the amount of data that's at your disposal, which which allows sort of the some of the more challenges of of, of tuning epsilon to sort of go away, which is sort of a, a long-standing constraint. Um, and secondarily, I think it's also really important to remember that differential privacy is not necessarily something that it needs to be used in an all or nothing context, right? So I think, for example, it's it's perfectly reasonable to think that different that you'll use sort of a hard differential privacy budget on again, as a, as a measure of risk for this promote execution tool for like kind of the intermediate data science that you're doing, you know, while, while you're sort of learning about a problem. And then you can have a separate discussion over like, oh, wow, okay, the final result that I'm working with is a histogram that's only over 50 people. Differential privacy is not going to work in this context. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to submit to the approval queue, right? And say, hey, I need you to like, I need you to allow me to see these results in the raw without differential privacy added because, you know, at the end of my analysis, I, I'm actually only studying 50 people, right? And so, so I think, um, if you if you read kind of a differential privacy paper out of like out of context of, of, of the data science experience, it's easy to go, why would I use this? It adds a bunch of noise to my results. But when you actually think about it in the context of of the sort of remote statistics, or remote data science sort of experience, differential privacy is your friend because this is the thing that should allow you to be able to to not have to wait for you know, for days for or, or go on site or whatever for like your statistical results. And if you happen to want to download something where differential privacy would obfuscate it, then you, you, you submit just those results to the final queue for someone to manually sit back and go, OK, ethically, is the world more likely to get better or worse if I give you this piece of information? Because that's a massively nuanced question. Like the question of like, should you be allowed to produce a histogram that's only based on 10 people is is is, is so context dependent. We, we can't really have a tool that's sort of one size fits all, like, like differential privacy to, to, answer, to answer these sort of really nuanced ethical questions. But we can use these tools to sort of cover a lot of the easy stuff and get that out of the way so that, you know, the only thing that you're ever waiting for in terms of a statistician when you're waiting for access to data is never access to the underlying records. You can always just go do your experiment, right? It's just access to, to results that might be privacy invasive and that need some sort of ethical review to, to, to happen, you know, before you sort of see them in the raw. And I think that's strictly speaking, a much better user experience for everyone involved, including the data subject and the data scientist and the data owner than sort of the trade-offs that we face today. So, so, um, so super important question, Ronald. Um, and I guess that was a really long answer to, to, to nutshell, um, tuning epsilons, there's no hard and fast rule. 
But the most important thing to remember is that Epsilon is not there to be an absolute blanket block on data leaving an institution. Epsilon is there to lower the friction for, for your lower risk queries that are over huge databases where, where it can be automated. And for things that need closer ethical review because it might be leaking private information, you just send that into the queue um, um, uh, through, as, as a part of this workflow. Um, and so I think that that sort of alleviates a lot of the concern about about uh, when, when viewed in that context, I think that alleviates a lot of the concern over different like difference of privacy, adding noise to sort of statistical results. Excellent. Thanks a lot. I'm going to see if we can rush through to get some more questions. I, it's a really rich discussion. I hope people can keep uh, keep the questions coming. So we have uh, in, from Mariana Nevis. She asks mm -hmm. in the technique you are suggesting, you would have to considerably increase the sample size to be able to capture a representative occurrence of rare events. Is this correct? Um, yeah. So in, in differential privacy, um, de again, depending on the 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 um, like I said, there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off between three things: like the 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 sample size, the um, the privacy guarantee that you that you that you want to have, and sort of the the um, 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 the this, I guess the sensitivity of your of, of your query, um, and so or at least the accuracy of your results. Excuse me. Um, and so so um, um, you know, if you you want to have a stronger Privacy budget and, and use differential privacy as your as, as as the justification for why you should see the results. You do need to have a, a sufficiently large sample size for for the 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 effect to the accuracy of results to be negligible to not noticeable, right? Um, but the good news is remote execution is all about giving you access to you know an order of magnitude or two more information. If you assume that there's at least ten to hundred other organizations of comparable size to your own that have or, or larger that have similar data that you would like to work with, like that the, sort of the whole premise is that you're no longer going to be working with data just one institution or with data at loads of institutions at a time. And so the sample size should be able to increase quite significantly. And secondarily, this is not saying that you always have to increase the sample size, but it's saying that if your sample size is large enough. Where differential privacy can be used relatively easily, which I think in the context of remote execution is going to be frequent, um, um, that you can you can skip the line, you, you can circumvent having to go through a really complex privacy analysis where someone has to sit down and weigh the ethical dilemma of like letting you see this private data versus protecting the privacy of the individuals under, underneath the asset because there's just no risk because the differential privacy budget is, is so tight, right? Um, so I think I think the idea is it, it's not it's not a universal thing. It's not saying that like. That like um, you have to use differential privacy, and all of your statistical results are going to have like loads of noise. Um, it's saying that like for the ones where differential privacy is the right tool to allow you to skip the line and be able to view your statistical results immediately, um, um, it's a great tool. If you have to be working with small data that, that's remotely, um, um, then then you would you would still go through I think a standard um, a standard sort of review process to, to to view the results sort of in the context. Excellent. Thank you very much. So the next question is from Inkyung Choi. She asks, what is the implication of accessing data in this way in terms of uh, reduce, reproducibility? So how does it affect reproducibility? Oh, how man. do you ensure? That, yeah, yeah th this, oh, sorry, uh, I, I didn't see. I, 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 I was following along the question. I hadn't expanded the thing. Um, um, th it's actually really, really great for reproducibility. Why? Because if you're remotely executing, executing data, they have an exact log of every single message, every single statistical function that you you sent over the network, right? Which means that, and, and secondarily, it means that people who are outside of your own institution can reproduce your statistical results without having to also get access to super private data. This is like really, really important uh, um, um, for the statistical community, but also like, I mean, this is like a total game changer for communities like um, like the medical imaging community, medical imaging community, like medical imaging research. They, 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 they publish papers all the time comparing results with different test data sets because no one has access to anyone else's test data set because they all work at different medical institutions, right? Whole communities that, that, that don't know really whether one approach is sort of better than other recently provided approach. But the, the, the amazing thing about remote execution environment is it offers the potential not only for an exact log of your experiment to happen automatically without you having to even really do any work, but also for others to come behind you and rerun the same experiments on the same data without having to have necessarily privileged access to that information. And, and of course, approvals for those types of experiments is really easy. I want to do exactly the same thing that you already approved for this previous person. May I please have permission to do that? And they go, oh yeah, sure. Let me pull up the uh, log of, of, of that computation and, and you're welcome to run it, right? And, 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 and that's that. 
So I think there's there's still like you know engineering stuff to make that really fluid. Like that, that's not something you can do really turnkey today. But 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 um, in principle, this should be a huge huge win for reproducibility. Um, and in the sense that like all research should be re should be reproducible because there's 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 a log of exactly um, what was done uh, when the, when the first uh, research was done. Is this is this something that would be similar to you know when you're when you're doing random random methods in Python you have random dot seed. You know, mm -hmm. you could you could give it almost if you wanted to really ensure you know not numerical reproducibility where you could you could almost say, I want to, I you publish your results with a with a random hash say mm -hmm. that has uh, which corresponds to the data sets you would have used. Oh uh, would, yeah, would absolutely. Be, okay. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Well, then, or then even, it'd be reproducible. Totally, totally, and, and and that that should even be a function on the network. I think like the kind of thing where like you should be able to take your experiment and sort of have the record of that and publish that as like a public asset on you know the, a network or domain node or something like that, so for people to go behind it and sort of verify that. I mean, e even then, like just the fact that there's a, there's an independent neutral actor who has a log of, of the stuff like that. That's already a, a yeah. lot of even if people don't actually go behind you and actually do it, just the notion that like. That, that there is a log that, that sort of some neutral third party saw it wasn't just you to your laptop right do it doing something um, is I think a really a huge win um, for that by itself. Yeah, so I think our last question that I see unless I'm missing one if I am please raise your hand to ask, is the, is the final one. Um, can you act as a data catalog in each institution, including metadata. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I think I think uh, and when when I when I talked about search, what that was searching was the data catalog and the metadata, right? So I think I searched uh, di diabetes, right? And so that was searching through the public metadata to to find you know the the search term diabetes and then returning pointers to all the different data sets that it found that sort of matched that search term. So yeah, I think that's that's sort of like the the workflow. Like the workflow is like log in, log in, you know, get access, you know, uh, get, get a user account at a, a domain or a network, search for data that's relevant to your problem, apply to be able to work work with that data. You know, they 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 if if it's a data that's potentially sensitive, run your experiment and then either download your results automatically because it was under a privacy budget that you were given, or or submit sort of the results for a sort of ethical review. Um, uh, in the context of remote execution. Excellent. This is really great. So actually, I, I think I, I lied. I have one one more question that I want to ask myself, and then I think we're going to uh, probably close. Yeah, that thinks me. Um, and I'm going to bundle it with another question that I missed here. So it's a, one is, can you make it work on smartphones? So that's the first half mm -hmm. of the question. The yeah. other half of the question is, uh, where where do we? So I mean. I'm I'm not part of the open mind community, so I don't. So if you you had these questions, uh, you said you know we don't want to use M M M N I S T anymore. We want to do you know cancer as our data set, which is mm -hmm. a, a logical jump if you think of the human impact of this. But you know then you talk about the need for for institutions to share data for networks. So for mm -hmm. for me, I see this as a a, a very uh, specific kind of project or initiative that happens. And I see where does this start. Do we start mm. by connecting, you know, hospitals, uh, data centers, so that we can have the ability to, you know, publish a data set on cancer? That you know, mm -hmm. you know, if we, if we had to do this in an incrementalist way, we'd say, okay, let's tackle something that has that impact instead. Let's tackle cancer. Yeah. And we say, look, we have now we have to connect all of the all of these MRI data sets, and it raises a very specific set of problems. So the mm -hmm. question is. Where do we start and how close are we to being able to formulate projects like that on the basis of these technologies broadly taken? Um, it's a fantastic question. Um, and I think actually you sort of there's, there's several people on the privacy preserving task team that are that sort of really trying to unpack this question in very real, real ways. There's some really awesome pilot projects going on. Um, 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 that I think I think some, some of them were featured in the in the previous privacy preserving task team handbook um, um, uh, and the sort of continued uh, I think registry being being worked on for, for people who are piloting this type of technology. Um, I would say just at broad strokes, um, I think it, it, it it's going to start with with um, enterprises with significant IT infrastructure and expertise before it gets to smartphones for, for various reasons. So so first, um, they're the ones who already have the data. Like, I like, guess smartphones have a lot of data, but still typically managed by large institutions. Um, second, they, they have the ability to sort of lean into sort of new technology and have like sort of technologists who are around. And, you know, if I'm using a data science interface and like saying, hey, I want three epsilon or two epsilon or whatever, like there's just like a lot of um, 
the, the UX doesn't have to be quite as mature to, to do that, as opposed to if I was doing data science across, you know, 100 million smartphones, you know, what does it mean for 100 million individuals to have independent ethical review of like of you working with their data, right? I mean, it's like there's like a whole other institution that's needed there, which means we need network nodes over these over these sort of large groups of phones, probably doing an ethical review for them. And it's sort of like it's, it's, it's more mature technology, more mature institutions, more mature sort of expectations and awareness that kind of needs to happen before this is sort of large scale um, on, on like sort of direct to consumers. But I think that that's absolutely sort of the future. If, if I had to take a guess, um, I think this year is the year we're going to start seeing it happen at, at statistics bureaus and at um, um, uh, sort of statistics organizations in, within government and within academia, um, particularly basically non-commercial use cases, like where there's not money changing hands as a result of the experiment. Um, and then I think sort of next year and the year after is when we're probably going to start to see some of the first commercial actors come online um, um, who are saying, oh my gosh, you know, instead of selling data outright, I'm going to have people bring their experiments to me, which is also really good for privacy because, you know, previously um, the, 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 you know, you make the most money from selling data as fast as possible um, as opposed to maintaining control over the only copy. Um, and so, so like this has a this has like a bit of a cut out the middleman kind of kind of uh, effect to the market, which would be really good for privacy. And then I think kind of the third wave is is probably sort of direct to consumer devices. And this is everything from kind of like your you know in home assistance, you know your little GPU in the corner that talks to you and does things for you and measures data and it talks to your Fitbit and all this kind of stuff, um, to to probably some kind of data trust, uh, which I, I would I would expect sort of retail banks to be the most likely players there because they they have deep trust with loads of consumers. They have the ability to operate in a highly regulated environment, um, and they, they they know how to operate sort of serious cloud infrastructure in, in a very secure way. So it seems like they would be the most like like actual banks are the most likely to become sort of data banks for for consumers. And so that's, that's sort of how I expect the, sort of the progression to happen over the next sort of three to five years. Excellent. Thank you so much. I have to say this has been a wonderful talk, and I've really appreciated it. You know, personally, I'm very interested in this type of research. And haven't had much exposure to it. So thank you very much. I'm, you know, I, if this were a big crowd, you'd hear 54 people clapping, but right now, <laughs> just me alone in my living room. So I'll have people thank you. unmute yourself if you can. You can almost be great. <laughs> you guys are very nice. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, and, and if you are interested, uh, please do join. Um, uh, slack.openmind.org. Uh, there's a whole community of people that are, are trying to help champion these things. And if you want to learn more, uh, check out courses.openmind.org uh, for free free courses that sort of teach. Um, the first one is non-technical. Um, that goes just through like sort of what it's going to do like business and society and, and political science and sort of and democracy and things like that. And the second course is sort of deeply technical, going into like the math and implementing algorithms from scratch and stuff like that. So if, if any of that sounds like fun to you, um, yeah, I'll see you around the community. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'm going to close the meeting now. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Thank you. Bye-bye.